Hello, my name is Omar Rowan, and I'm an associate professor of radiology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Today, I'd like to discuss my approach to evaluate an MRI examination of the hip. And I usually start with a coronal T1 weighted image of the hip, and I do that just to look to see the marrow, to make sure that there are no marrow contusions or fractures, to make sure that I don't see any T1 hypointense line to suggest a fracture, and looking at the femoral head, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the femoral head looks intact without any T1 hypointense signal. The marrow signal intensity also looks normal. What I mean by that on T1 is there's no signal within the fatty marrow that's isointense or darker than the underlying muscle to suggest a marrow infiltrative process, such as infection or tumor. There are some patchy areas of red marrow within the pelvis that's expected, and notice that it appears to be slightly hyperintense to the underlying musculature. I also like to look at the focal articular cartilage, which is this gray intermediate signal coating the femoral head and the acetabulum here. It looks nice and thick, as I would expect. This normal indentation along the femoral head is known as a fovea capitis. That's where the ligamentum teres inserts onto the femoral head. That's a normal finding, not to be confused with a subchondral fracture. Okay, this is the greater trochanter, the lesser trochanter, the femoral head, femoral neck, femoral shaft right here. This here is the ischial tuberosity, the acetabulum, the superior pubic ramus, the pubic symphysis right here, and the sacroiliac joint right here. So everything on the T1 weighted image looks great. I then turn to the coronal stir or T2 fat sat weighted image and I'm looking here to see if there's any marrow edema and so far there's no associated marrow edema within the femoral head, femoral shaft, acetabulum, sacroiliac joints, every the marrow itself looks totally normal. There's no marrow contusion or fracture. There's no evidence of avascular necrosis within the femoral head. There's no serpiginous abnormal geographic signal intensity to suggest AVN or avascular necrosis within the femoral head. I can also assess to see if there's a joint effusion, and there is some physiologic fluid within the femoral acetabular joint, however, not enough to call a joint effusion. Okay. I can look at the lower lumbar spine, notice that there's nice bright signal intensity within the disc, so there's no evidence of disc desiccation. The disc height is maintained. There's no end plate irregularities within the lower lumbar spine. Looking at the sacroiliac joint, the synovial portion of the joint is the anterior inferior aspect of the joint. That's the part that gets involved with uh, articular processes like degenerative joint disease and inflammatory arthropathies. The remainder of the sacroiliac joint is ligamentous connections. Okay, so that all looks very good. This here is the hamstring tendons, this dark hypointense structure inserting onto the ischial tuberosity. This is made up of the semimembranosis, semitendinosis, and biceps femoris tendons. We can also take a look at the adductor tendons right here that are inserting onto the pubic symphysis. They're inserting normally these hypointense structures both on the left and right side. The rectus abdominis muscle also inserts along the pubic symphysis superiorly and you can have a sports hernia or athletic pubalgia where you get a tear of the subaponeurotic plate and you can get avulsion of the adductor tendon or the rectus abdominis more superiorly. Here, this is the iliopsoas tendon inserting onto the lesser trochanter, this hypointense structure right here inserting onto the lesser trochanter. Avulsion of the lesser, the iliopsoas tendon onto the lesser trochanter in an adult is pathologic until proven otherwise, usually heralds the presence of a malignancy. The gluteal tendons, the gluteus medius and minimus inserted onto the greater trochanter, you can see part of that right here. Okay. The labrum is this fibrocartilaginous structure that we see right here. Uh, people can have labral tears, and you're looking for increased signal coursing through the labrum to suggest a labral tear. Now, the labrum within the hip is much different than the labrum within the shoulder. And to illustrate that, I want to turn to a sagittal image through the labrum. Notice this is not an arthrogram, so we're not uh, distending the joint to fully evaluate the labrum. However, the labrum in the shoulder is a 360-degree structure. It, it courses over the entire circumference of the glenoid. However, that's not true within the hip. The labrum about the hip is a 270 degree structure and only courses three quarters of the way throughout the uh, hip joint socket. The, la the labrum courses anteriorly right here and it courses all the way posteriorly right here along the acetabular fossa and rim. The last 90 degrees, which is this area right here that I'm outlining by my 
arrow bridging the anterior and posterior rib of the acetabulum is bridged by the transverse ligament. This is known as a transverse ligament. So again, the labrum is only 270 degrees in the hip, 360 degrees in the shoulder. And the transverse ligament connects the anterior and posterior acetabular rim and the ligament of teres that I talked about earlier, which is this structure right here along the fovea capitis, comes in and inserts onto the transverse ligament. So the ligament of teres goes from the fovea, fovea capitis to the transverse ligament. Okay, notice that the labrum looks very good on this coronal or sagittal, excuse me, stir image, and there's no increased signal from the labrum to suggest a labral tear. However, this is not an orthographic study. Okay, so that is a way to evaluate the osseous structures, um, the labrum, and the cartilaginous structures. Notice again here, the cartilage looks nice and pristine. There's no T2 hypertense signal within the underlying cartilage to suggest a focal chondral defect. Labral pathology can become important in femoral acetabular impingement. Femoral acetabular impingement is a morphological abnormality that occurs when people flex and abduct their hip, and you can have two different types of uh, femoral acetabular impingement. You can have a pincer type of impingement where you have over coverage of the acetabulum. On radiographs, you can measure a center edge lateral opening angle, and if that angle is more than 40 degrees, you have over coverage of the acetabulum, and that reflects pincer type femoral acetabular impingement. You can have a cam type femoral acetabular impingement where you have lack of offset at the femoral head neck junction and that can result in a cam type of femoral acetabular impingement. You can have an osseous protuberance or an ossified at the femoral head neck junction or you can have flattening or lack of offset which is also known as a pistol grip deformity and that can be seen in the setting of femoral acetabular impingement. And femoral acetabular impingement is important because it can lead to early osteoarthritis, chondral defects, and labral tearing which I don't know that I necessarily see in this patient. Since we're on the sagittal image, I want to show you a couple of tendons. This here is the gluteus medius tendon inserting onto the posterior superior facet of the greater trochanter. So this dark hypotense structure is the gluteus medius tendon inserting onto the posterior superior facet of the greater trochanter. This dark hypotense structure right here is the gluteus minimus tendon inserting onto the anterior facet of the greater trochanter. Then you have a bunch of other tendons like the piriformis, which is coming in right here, inserting onto the piriformis fossa. You have the obturator internus right here, inserting onto the piriformis fossa. You have the obturator externus, which is right here, inserting onto the piriformis fossa. So a lot of tendons are coming in here, inserting normally onto their respective locations. I want to turn to the sagittal T1 weighted image just to, again, assess the marrow, the muscular bulk, make sure there's no fatty atrophy. Okay, this is the iliopsoas muscle right here coming in anteriorly. You have the gluteal muscles here posteriorly. Uh, everything so far looks pretty good. I'm going to turn now to the axial T2 fat sat weighted images. And again, look at the marrow. Again, the marrow is normal at the hip joint. This is the fovea capitis, the ligament of teres inserting onto the fovea capitis. There's no joint effusion. Again, the labrum, this is the anterior labrum right here. This is the posterior labrum. There's no T2 hypertension signal within the labrum to suggest labral tearing. Okay, there's no paralabral cysts. That could be a clue to the diagnosis of a labral tear. There's no focal chondral defects. The marrow looks good. This is part of the sacroiliac joint here. Overall, it's maintained. This is the inferior pubic ramus, the pubic symphysis, the superior pubic ramus, all of which look intact. No joint effusion seen. If we take a look at the muscles, we want to look at the muscles to make sure there's no T2 hyperintensity to suggest muscular contusion or strain. A strain, as you know, happens from eccentric muscular contraction from exercise. A contusion is in the setting of trauma. Okay, So this here is the iliacus muscle, this is a psoas muscle right here, okay? As we come down here, this tendon is going to insert, the iliopsoas is going to insert onto the lesser trochanter, and again, an avulsion of this in adult is pathologic and will prove it otherwise, so that's the iliopsoas muscle and tendon. These here are the gluteal muscles, this is the gluteus minimus, gluteus medius, gluteus maximus. They're separated by a thin fat plane, which is difficult to see here, but if you take a look here, this dark hypotense structure is the gluteus medius tendon. If we trace it back, it's going to insert onto the posterior superior facet and the lateral facet of the greater trochanter. It's normal. It's intact. There's no T2 hyperintense signal within it or discontinuity to suggest a tear or partial tear. Okay, just deep to the gluteus medius tendon is a potential space called the subgluteus medius bursa. Notice that there's no fluid distending it to suggest subgluteus medius bursitis. Okay, the gluteus minimus, which is this muscle here, 
And this tendon right here, which is this dark hypotenuse structure, that's going to insert onto the anterior facet of the greater trochanter. Notice that it's inserting onto the anterior facet, where my arrow is, of the greater trochanter. This potential space deep to it is called the subgluteus minimus bursa. There's no fluid in here to suggest a subgluteus minimus bursitis. And the gluteus maximus does not insert onto the greater trochanter. It inserts onto the linea aspera, which is along the posterior femur more distally. However, the gluteus maximus does give fibers to the iliotibial band or the iliotibial tract, which is also uh, starts from the iliac crest and the tensor fasciae latae muscle. This is going to insert more inferiorly along the knee, along the Gerdes tubercle. Okay, so that's the gluteus maximus. It's important also to look at the adductor muscles. These are the adductor longus, brevis, magnus. These adductor tendons are going to insert right here onto the pubic symphysis right here. Notice that they're normal. These are the right adductor tendons inserting onto the pubic symphysis, so there's no adductor tendon tear. And then the hamstring tendons, which are right here, these two tendons, these two dark hypotenuse structures, are going to start right here onto the ischial tuberosity. The more anterior lateral structure is the semimembranosus, and the more posterior structure is the conjoint tendon of the semitendinosus and the bicep femoris tendon. So again, semimembranosus anterior laterally, more posteriorly is the semitendinosus and bicep femoris tendon. They insert right here onto the ischial tuberosity. There may be some trace peritendinitis there along the semimembranosus tendon insertion onto the ischial tuberosity right there, but overall the tendon is intact. There's no tearing or partial tearing there. Okay. Some of the other muscles that you might want to look for are, this is a sartorius, it's going to insert onto the anterior superior iliac spine right there. The rectus femoris, which is right here, that's going to insert onto the anterior inferior iliac spine, which is right there. It has a straight and reflected head, which is sometimes difficult to discern on imaging, but that's the rectus femoris. This is the tensor fasciae latte. This also gives some fibers to the iliotibial tract, as I discussed earlier. Okay. This is the obturator muscles, obturator internus and externus right here. This muscle right here is the piriformis muscle. Notice that all the muscles are normal. There's no muscular uh, hyperintense edema. This is part of the sciatic nerve coming right over the piriformis muscle. Okay. It's always important to look at the vascular flow voids and make sure they're maintained to make sure that there's no dissection or thrombosis within the femoral vessels. These are inguinal nodes, none of which that are pathologically enlarged right here. It's always important to look at the bladder. It's distended. There is some free fluid within the pelvis. This here is the uterus. No intramural or uterine fibroids identified here. No nebothian cysts seen here. Uh, the rest of the study looks great. And then I'm just going to take a look at the axial proton density weighted images to make sure that the muscular bulk is preserved. There's no T1 hyperintense signal to suggest fatty atrophy within any of these muscles here. Again, this is the iliopsoas muscle. This is the sartorius muscle right here, rectus femoris, tensor fasciae latte, the vastus lateralis muscle, the adductor ten muscles and tendons, the gluteal muscles right here. This muscle right here is a quadratus femoris. This is important because if you have edema within this muscle at this level, that can result in ischiofemoral impingement when there's narrowing of the space between the femur and the ischial tuberosity. This quadratus femoris muscle can have T2 hyperintense edema associated with it. This is a sciatic nerve that's better seen on the T1 or the proton density image. Okay. This is the rectus abdominis muscle right here. It looks great. I would show you how to measure an alpha angle, but we don't have a true axial oblique image. So I can't show you how to measure a true alpha angle, but an alpha angle greater than 55 degrees is abnormal, and that can be associated with CAM-type femoral acetabular impingement. And then finally, you just want to look at the subcutaneous structures, make sure there's no masses, no edema. I can come back to the T2-weighted image. The subcutaneous tissues appear to be grossly intact. And that, essentially, in a nutshell, is my evaluation for an MRI examination of the hip. We looked at the osseous structures, the cartilaginous structures, the intraarticular structures. We looked at the labrum. We looked at all the tendons. Uh, we looked at the muscles, the intrapelvic contents, and the inguinal region. Thank you so much for your attention.